Hello and welcome again. My name is Megan Davidson and I'm the Assistant Dean of Students for Parent and Family Engagement within the Office of the Dean of Students. I'm thrilled to have you all here today and to moderate our UD Parent and Family Connect, Spring 2022. The UD Parent and Family Connect was developed to allow faculty and staff to connect with families so that students are supported well. We will give about a 30 minute presentation by topic experts. For the remaining 20 to 30 minutes, families will be able to submit live questions into the Zoom Q&A feature. I encourage families to hold their questions until the pre presenters finish their content. This presentation was de designed by my fellow panelists and from questions families submitted in advance. Today, we will focus on spring 2021. This session will provide context around COVID protocol and the spring semester. Some questions were submitted in advance about graduation. Please note that we're currently planning graduation and we hope to post one of these UD Parent and Family Connects about graduation in the coming months. Today, we will hear from Luis, uh, Jose Luis Riera, our Vice President of Student Life. He will provide an overview and context. Following Jose is Dr. Kelly Frick, our Director of Student Health Services and University Physician. She will speak about COVID safety and well being protocols and procedures. Then, our Dean of Students, Adam Cantley, will share information about student engagement and reporting. After the presentation, we will transition to the question and answers portion. Families using the Zoom webinar feature may submit type questions at any time in the Q&A feature of Zoom. However, as I already said, we encourage you to wait until the pre presentation as many of your questions may be answered. Questions may be answered live by our panelists or within the text chat by many of my colleagues. The combination of live answers and type questions will allow us to answer as many questions as we can in the time provided. So thank you all for being here tonight and I'm gonna hand it off to Jose. Good evening, Blue Hen families and thank you for joining us. You can go to the next slide, Kevin. Um, if you've joined us in the past, you know that we like to start with just some institutional context about uh, how decision making happens at the university around issues of COVID in particular, um, and also just to set a stage for what's happening currently um, and, and to give you context for some of what you're seeing coming from us. So as always, uh, we've really stuck to three principles uh, since February of 2020. And that is that uh, we're, we're first and foremost thinking about our people, our students, our staff, our faculty, the community around us, and prioritizing their health and safety. Um, we are also always thinking about academic continuity, ensuring that students can continue making the progress they need to be making academically towards degree and really being able to excel um, uh, in doing that. And then finally, uh, moving on this trajectory of restoring the rhythms of campus life, uh, which, which we certainly made large strides last semester in doing, and that was very exciting. Next slide. So in addition to the senior leadership at the university, there are a number of groups um, that are formally gathered to look at uh, various dimensions of decision making throughout the pandemic. The first is our Health Advisory Council, which is a group of scientific, medical, epidemiological, and campus operation experts to discuss various policies and procedures that need to be enacted to ensure a health and safety, uh, health, a healthy and safe learning environment um, for all of our students. And then there's the COVID-19 operations group, which is really the group that's looking at how do they enact the various policies and procedures and make sure that students, staff, and faculty have everything they need to be supported throughout the pandemic. All of these different places that you see um, listed below are all points of data that come into our decision making. To give you an example in real time, uh, because obviously many of you are not from Delaware, the state of Delaware right now, the governor uh, reenacted a state of emergency here in the state of Delaware. And with that enacted a mandatory indoor mask mandate in all places in the state of Delaware. So K-12 is currently fully masked, uh, all higher education institutions. Um, and so th those are some of the things we have to take into consideration, obviously, um, as we're thinking about 
uh, various policies and procedures. Next slide. So who's been vaccinated and who's been boosted? And you'll hear more about this in a bit. In a, in a, in a bit. But a reminder that today is the deadline for eligible students to upload their booster documentation. And they can do that through what's called the UD Health Portal, um, which we've pushed out to them um, on, on a number of occasions. Uh, right now, based on approved exemptions, we're at a rate of 91% vaccinated students. Um, that means that uh, the, the balance of those students have received medical or religious exemptions from the university. And you can see our numbers um, in, in the employee ranks, which are quite strong as well. So overall, uh, we're in a really good place from a vaccination standpoint uh, to be a campus that is quite safe to be interacting um, on a daily basis. Next slide. So a couple notes about what's happening now, and I'm just gonna tease some things that you're gonna hear more about as we move through the presentation. Um, so the, the, the most significant one that we wanna make sure everyone is aware of is that our first week of academic course delivery for the semester will be delivered in a virtual modality. Um, an online modality. And, um, and then we do plan to resume face-to-face -face, and we've prepared our faculty and staff that we will resume face-to-face -face for all classes uh, that are set up as such starting February 14th. There are some exemptions to classes that will be in person. So faculty could apply for exemptions. Why would we give an exemption? Well, in cases where there's a clinical class, a hands-on class, a class where the pedagogy really would be compromised if it wasn't in person, that class may be happening in person. Uh, so it's really important for your student to check their schedule and to understand um, exactly how their class is being delivered. Of course, we've gotten lots of questions. Why are you doing that? So I just wanted to address very quickly that the reason we're going with an online modality for week one is actually not because we feel like the health and safety of our students and staff and faculty could be compromised in the classroom but it's because we are requiring pre-arrival testing. And you will learn more about that as we go through our time today. We are estimating that about 10 to 15% of our students upon taking pre-arrival testing will test positive. So that's somewhere around 2,000 to 2,500 students. We thought it would be really important for those students to not be disadvantaged by not being able to participate in the first week of classes. Because of course, if you test positive in your pre-arrival testing, the instructions are for you to stay home. So we felt like the most equitable opportunity for all students to continue in their academics would be to be online for that first week. Additionally, many other services will be in person. Our residence halls will obviously be open. Our dining halls will be open. We'll also be having activities and events on campus. And knowing that those who have tested positive will be home, makes those environments safer for us to be able to do that. Uh, masking will be required, required indoors. Uh, and the only place that at this point we're not including in the mask mandate are in individual rooms in residence halls on campus. We will continue to ask students, staff and faculty to fill out their daily symptom checker, just something they're likely very used to doing. Um, we will control for density and physical distancing as needed on campus, uh, not in every environment, but in some. And then finally, we will continue various, um, our vaccination programs uh, for those who still need to be boosted and our testing programs. And you'll hear more details about that. So thanks again for joining us. And um, I hope that you find tonight really informational. Thank you, Jose. Uh, next slide, please, Kevin. So as we're looking at heading into spring semester, um, putting obviously our priority on the health and safety of our students and our faculty and staff. Uh, as Jose mentioned, we've instituted pre-arrival testing um, for all students and employees who will be on campus during spring semester. This pre-arrival testing window runs from yesterday, Monday, January 31st, through Sunday, February 6th. Your student can use any type of test to complete the pre-arrival testing. They can use a lab-based PCR test um, from a community testing site or a pharmacy testing site. They can also use a home-based uh, antigen test, a test that they do themselves at home. The key is that they need to upload their results um, to their UD Health portal. Um, there's instructions on the coronavirus um, FAQ website as well as student health website of how to upload their results. 
they need to capture a picture or a PDF of their test result and then enter their type of test, the date that their test was taken, their test result uh, into their UD Health portal. As Jose mentioned a little bit, um, the reason that we're proposing to go online for the first week is, is to preserve the academic structure within that first week. So the goal of pre-arrival testing is to reduce the amount of COVID that's coming back to campus at the start of the semester. We know because of community numbers, we know that there's a chunk of, of students and employees who are going to test positive on that pre-arrival testing. That might be faculty members. It might be 15% you know, of certain classrooms. So in order to keep everyone on an even playing field at the beginning of the semester so that folks are not hampered for, you know, from their ability to come back into the classroom, um, we're preparing for the first week of classes to be online. The goal is if your student tests positive on their pre-arrival test, that they stay home and complete their seven-day isolation period at home before coming back to campus. The same are expected of employees. If an employee tests positive on their pre-arrival test, they're not expected to come to campus until they finish their seven-day isolation period. Next slide, please. And then we're looking at protecting our campus during spring semester. So we will have ongoing COVID vaccine and booster clinics that will be held on campus. Um, we also have a number of local pharmacies around who are um, offering vaccines. We have Rite Aid, um, CVS, and Walgreens all within walking distance of campus. We also have a public health clinic called the Hudson Center, which is at the very end of Main Street, um, that's offering vaccinations and boosters as well. We continue to have asymptomatic and symptomatic testing available on campus. Asymptomatic testing is through UD surveillance testing, which is Monday through Thursday. And then symptomatic testing we have at Student Health Services Monday through Friday. There are also a number of community testing sites that will be close to campus through Curative, um, mainly on Fridays and some weekend days as well. Another uh, update for spring semester is uh, the increase of required uh, populations for vaccination and boosters on campus. So all students, faculty, and student-facing staff are now required to be up to date with COVID vaccination uh, or file an exemption. Folks who are unvaccinated or unboosted um, will be required to test weekly with a PCR test. That PCR test can be done on campus at UD Surveillance, or it can be done off campus at a community testing site. If your student is required to test weekly and they test off campus, they will need to upload their weekly test results to their UD Health Portal. Next slide, please. So Jose mentioned that today is actually the deadline um, for students to submit their vaccination and booster cards. Um, we've got, gotten some questions of students who may not be eligible for the booster by the deadline. Um, if they're not eligible by the time of the deadline, they will have um, 30 days from their point of eligibility to receive the booster. So folks that perhaps were vaccinated in the fall um, who won't become eligible until further in the spring, they will have 30 days um, to get their booster when their time um, comes. Just a reminder, you're eligible for your booster if it's been more than five months from your second Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or more than two months from your single J&J &J vaccine. Uh, a copy of the student's um, COVID uh, vaccination or booster card should be uploaded to the UD Health portal to show documentation of their booster. Uh, there's more information as well on the COVID FAQ site on how to upload, um, as well as kind of uh, unique situations for an individual's um, booster situation. Next slide, please. Exemptions. So uh, UD offers uh, exemptions for the COVID vaccine or the COVID booster um, for authorized medical or religious purposes. Uh, there is an, also an option for a temporary medical exemption um, if that's been recommended by the student's healthcare provider that they delay their booster for any health reason. Um, there are instructions on uh, the COVID-19 section of the student health website for information on the required forms, um, who has to complete what sections of the required forms. Um, for the medical exemption form, there is a healthcare provider section as well as a student section. For the religious exemption form, uh, there's two pages of student sections. And then there's instructions on the website of how to upload that documentation and where to upload it onto their UD Health portal. And I'll turn it over to Adam Cantley, Dean of Students. Good evening, everyone. I'm here to talk a little bit about student engagement and support for spring 2022. Uh, great to be back with all of you. Next slide, please. Um, compliance is something that we always get asked about. Uh, our general rule um, is that if uh, a staff member would see somebody uh, not complying with our mask mandate or the, this current state mandate that our first initial step is to have educational conversations with them and, and do that. We do not want to refer students to our Office of Student Conduct for these things. So um, 
universally, we're going to have a conversation first and make sure. However, if somebody um, is repeatedly missing those violations um, or has a consistent track record, that's when our Office of Student Conduct would become involved um, and could um, help with the compliance of students in relation to COVID-19 guidelines. In terms of our vaccination records, um, Students who have not submitted their updated vaccination records or exemptions, as we have in the past, we send lots of reminders, we send um, plenty of notification about deadlines and times for that, they will have a hold placed on their academic account. That hold permits them from accessing um, their student record, making changes to their schedule until they either submit um, the needed documentation or have an approved exemption. Um, and that is consistent with what we did last fall in those areas. And there may be um, referrals to the Office of Student Conduct um, after specific amounts of time. Um, anybody on campus is welcome to report any community member for violations of policies related to COVID-19. It's important that students have the opportunity to um, violate folks who are not student, report student or non-students who may violate our policies as well. It is a universal expectation around masks and compliance uh, and things of that nature. So we have a website where depending on where somebody is in our community, they can report that. Our Office of Student Conduct, of course, does not handle concerns that are not student related, but there are compliance um, processes, faculty, staff, guests, vendors, things like that. Currently, the city of Newark does not have a gathering restriction in place as they have in the past. Um, we've had conversations with them. There have been discussions about re uh, putting that back in, but those have not come to fruition. We will continue to partner with the city uh, on that and be part of those conversations. If the city council would change anything, we would make sure that that would be shared with our students um, broadly and, and swiftly once it, it, it would have changed within the boundaries of the city of Newark, but at this time there are no gathering um, restrictions related to private residences. Next slide. <clears throat> I think a lot of people um, we are, are wondering what this will look like on campus. As we said, the state of Delaware currently has a mask mandate. So students are required to wear masks in shared spaces, even in our residence halls. However, they, of course, they can unmask in their individual rooms. Um, this is a little bit more strict than where we ended um, last uh, semester, um, but that is where we are starting this semester. Our, our resident staff, as I said, um, are addressing this primarily initially because we know it's a change in culture through educational conversations, reminders, signage, um, things like that. Dining halls and other on-campus eateries will be open. Um, our dining halls will have seated dining options as well as grab and go options. It'll be important for folks to read signage in those areas. So um, not all meals in dining are grab and go. I think a lot of people um, have asked questions about that in the chat already. So there will be both options depending on where you go, but our traditional dining halls will have seated options uh, available for folks indoors. Um, <clears throat> campus move-in, uh, we know we have a lot of people who are coming early, but our standard move-in hours are February 6th between 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. and February 7th between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. Residence Life and Housing has sent out plenty of information to folks about our move-in procedures for spring. If you have questions about those, please email uh, Res Life and Housing um, and they will help you out in terms of the next steps and what um, you can expect um, or if you have specific questions related to your student's room. Our student centers, Perkins uh, Student Center and the Trabant University University Center are fully open and operational. This includes the Hen Zone, Darty Hall, um, our esports arena, lounges, things like that. Um, just as a reminder, they are indoors, of course, so there will be masks um, required in those spaces uh, at all time. Um, we also have programs that will be both in-person, hybrid, and virtual. We know, once again, we have students studying in about every format imaginable, um, with the majority of our students being in person, um, but we will continue to offer hybrid and virtual options for programming and engagement and you can learn more at the student life virtual hub udell.edu slash student life next slide if you go to the student life website really the first thing that we're highlighting is 1743 welcome days we did them in the fall we do them in the spring as a way to welcome folks to campus once again all programs are open to all students um, nearly all programs will be in person um, and are open uh, for folks to attend of course if it is indoors which it will be because it's winter uh, masks will be required this is in line with our policies and regulations the big one that i want to highlight as always is that first week we will have um, our student 
involvement fair where students can learn more about student organizations and getting involved. Um, maybe if they were here in the fall semester, they didn't find a registered student organization that, that clicked with them, then they can find um, a new one this semester and meet with student leaders. Uh, there was also questions about um, RSO meetings. Will they be in person or virtual? The answer is that um, students can have in-person meetings. However, student leaders design the format of their organizations and how they meet. Um, so some student organizations are really good about those weekly meetings, some are not, um, and they do monthly meetings or some have chosen to do online meetings, but that is their prerogative as student leaders to run those organizations as they see fit. But student organizations can meet in person um, and do programming in person as well. Next slide. Student support and well being, um, of course, is something that we are all concerned about. The Warner Well Being Center will be open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and uh, on the south end of campus, just adjacent to Laurel Hall, where Dr. Frick's office is. There will be virtual and in person opportunities for physical and mental health support. Um, there is a general well being site um, that folks can access. And if your student is experiencing something that maybe has a lot of intersections with different offices or supports on campus, Campus and you need help navigating those, our office and the Office of the Dean of Students is happy um, to help you out. We um, I'll ask Megan to put our email address in the chat there. And we're happy to work with students who have some complex concerns about how um, they are um, interacting at the institution. So we are happy to support. And then I will turn it over to Megan. Great, thank you all. All right, so that was some, a lot, a lot of content. Um, so a couple of things I wanted to highlight that I put in. I just put in the Dean of Students um, email inbox. So if you're a student or you have any concerns, um, you can definitely, um, your student can reach out to our office. We're happy to meet with them for sure. I also, um, Dr. Frick had mentioned that there were three videos that she um, worked with some of our colleagues on campus and they're really informative and incredible. Um, we were joking earlier about how she's gonna go work in Hollywood now. Um, she did a really nice job. So I encourage you, those are the three posts within the Blue Hem Family Hub. So I just really encourage you after this session here to watch those, have your student watch those. Um, they provided a lot of clarity, I know for me. Um, definitely information about 1743 welcome days. And then many of you ha may have noticed that we are now, it's been a year actually, that we send a monthly newsletter that's specifically curated for families. It's called the announcements. Um, and so we sent one about two weeks ago and in two weeks coming, we'll have the next one when there actually be a letter from Adam as well as our new assistant vice president for well-being. Um, so you'll all be introduced to her as well. Um, so just, you know, there's tons and tons of hopefully really great information um, for all of us here today. So I'm going to invite now, um, of course, any family is welcome to email the coronavirus at udel.edu inbox if you have any questions, students for sure, but of course the families at udel.edu inbox is specifically for families, so you're welcome to, to send any questions that you have there as well. Okay, so I'm going to invite Jose and Kelly onto the, the, the screen here today, and we're going to jump into the question and answer portion. They did a really nice job getting through all the content um, of the presentation, um, so we're ready to rock and roll. So thank you for all your questions. Jose and Kelly don't want to join us? No, just kidding. Here's us. <laughs> um, okay, well, I'll have, so the first question, there was a fair amount of questions in the Q&A, um, Jose, about um, spring classes and the modality. So that's a word we use pretty regularly in higher education, definitely at the University of Delaware. And so that's whether it's an in-person class, a hybrid class, so some are in person, some are online, um, whether they're completely virtual, whether they're asynchronous, so they would kind of have um, modules and students can kind of work at their own pace, things like that. So Jose, can you give us an update on what the conversation is about, you know, the first week, but really kind of the rest of the semester? Um, and just, you know, why a faculty member would switch. Um, I don't have any data. I'm assuming you don't have any data. My guess is that most classes are definitely going to be in person in the spring. So if you can just kind of speak to that. And then maybe, Adam, if you want to afterwards talk about if a student has a concern about one of their classes switching over, what are their options for, um, for working with the university to update their schedule? Yeah, sure, Megan. So um, yeah, I think it's 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 important to talk about terms. So in person is obviously in class. Uh, generally, we split virtual class delivery 
into two different um, modes. One is called asynchronous and one is called synchronous. Asynchronous would be um, you would receive uh, content and um, you might receive video lectures, things like that, that you do on your own schedule. Synchronous contact context in a virtual modality would be you meet with your faculty just like we're doing right now. It's, it's live um, at the same time that the faculty, uh, at the same time that you have your course every day, you're meeting with that faculty member and having that, that um, virtual in-person exchange. Um, most virtual courses are certainly synchronous at this point. There may be some that are asynchronous, but most are synchronous. Um, and we have started uh, really marking all of these modalities in our catalog so that students know exactly what to expect uh, when they register for a class. At this point, if your student goes into their schedule and sees what the modalities are, that really should be what the modalities are for the semester. Um, so they should know whether a class is being delivered virtually, asynchronous, virtually synchronous, um, or, or in person or hybrid, uh, which would be a mix of the two. Um, we are planning to go in person starting February 14th. So um, unlike winter session where we did do the first week online and then we have reevaluated, we are planning for face-to-face -to, -face to resume on February 14th. Um, I will let you know that a faculty member has the ability to take any class online for two weeks. Um, if pedagogically, so for pedagogical teaching and learning reasons, they feel like that is what needs to happen. And, and where that is used the most um, is typically during a surge. So if we have a surge of cases and we have, let's say 10, 15, 20% of the student body is isolating and a faculty member is missing a quarter or a half of their class, uh, it would make more sense for that class to be delivered virtually so that all students can participate. And they can make that decision based on what's happening. Um, that didn't happen too often last semester. I don't expect that to happen too often this semester, but that certainly could account for why a modality could change mid-semester, but that's not the permanent modality of the class. So I hope that helps to give a little bit of a, a primer on, on modalities. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, currently uh, students have the av availability to make changes to their schedule. Um, if they would see a class modality that they would like to learn, if there's different options or other options available for in-person learning, we would encourage them to talk to their academic advisor or their academic assistant dean um, to see what options are available. If there's the option to take a different class that moves them towards degree or if there is an option um, for a different section. So I really think uh, the first step in that is if you have concerns about the modality of classes and wanna know what options are available, your advisor is your best resource to discuss um, what you can do. And again, I, this is anecdotal, um, you know, definitely Adam and I, we work with a lot of students. A lot of our students are preferring this, some in person, some, you know, one or so, um, you know, virtual that that kind of mix, you know, mix matching of courses allows them to have jobs, it allows them to study, it allows them to take internships, different things like that. So I know for many students that I connect, they appreciate a mixture um, of modalities across all their classes. And again, maybe um, there are some classes that um, the content, they want to be in person to do those discussions, but then this one they enjoy working independently. Um, so it's kind of a, 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 an and both um, for many. Megan, and, and can I address one more thing? I think we're talking about this kind of broad context, but there have been some questions about if my individual student would have to isolate, are faculty prepared to help them during that time to make sure that they have access to materials and the ability to get uh, things from the class? The answer is yes. All of our faculty um, have been told for the need for flexibility, the need for um, the ability to help students who need to isolate still um, maintain what they're doing in the classroom at that time. So these are official university excused absences within our excused absence policy. So faculty are working with them. A lot of faculty um, have recorded lectures that they can share with students and things of that nature. So, um, and some are providing even hybrid presentation options. So our faculty are working with students who, who need to isolate for short periods of time and uh, helping to keep them on track. Okay, so I have one of my colleagues who's here in the background. Can we have, so again, I don't know who, who wants to jump in to answer this, but can we just give a little bit of clarification as to why a class would go asynchronous instead of virtual? 
Jose, Adam. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, I can, I can answer that. So first, I, I, it might be helpful um, to have some uh, statistics or some data based on our classes. So, uh, ninety point zero four percent of our section courses will be delivered in person in the spring. That's three thousand four hundred seventy one sections. Um, and to clarify, because I answered this in the question bank, there is no longer any kind of limit where certain classes are default virtual. Like in the past, we've done if a class is over 50 people, for instance, it's virtual. There's no limit. We have full lecture halls at this point. 7.78% um, of our courses for the spring will be online. That's 300 sections. Um, and then 2.8% of classes, 84 sections are hybrid, online and face-to-face. -face. And, and, and just to underscore what Megan shared, um, we had over half of our students last year tell us that one of the things they wanted to retain from COVID was the ability to have some flexibility between online and in-person classes. So they want the lion's share of their classes in person, but they want the ability to have a virtual class in the mix. Um, and so, you know, right now we're at 90% in person. That's likely where the university, you know, I think we'll live between 90 and 95%. Um, and obviously we're building out our online portfolio as well in general, particularly in our special sessions like winter and summer, because it gives students the ability to be somewhere else and continue academic continuity. Um, asynchronous instruction is really a pedagogical um, uh, a decision of the faculty member, so I can't necessarily speak to why, um, but generally uh, in an asynchronous situation, it's because the faculty member is, is allowing the students to have uh, a bit more of a self-paced um, ability to finish a course. Uh, perhaps there's some customized um, interventions like supplemental classes or, um, or office hours or something where the faculty member is working with each student on a customized basis. Uh, in general, I don't think you'll be finding large classes, uh, required classes that are asynchronous. Doesn't mean that won't happen at all, but, but in general, that's one of the modalities of many that we offer, but certainly in the great minority compared to, to everything else. Great, all right. And again, a student can work with their advisor and or their academic assistant dean within their college through all this thing. So just encourage your student to reach out to those if, if that's helpful to them. Okay, so for our next question, I was hoping that Dr. Frick could do it. So can you just talk about a little bit of the plans? I know you, you, in the presentation you said it, but maybe you can just extend a little bit further. Will there be testing um, at the ICE lab, which is one of our large academic spaces on campus on Fridays or other times? Um, I know this past semester, there was a lot of different options. So can you just share what you currently know of as far as planning for testing on campus? Sure. So um, UD has a couple different options for testing depending on the situation that the student is in. So UD provides um, asymptomatic PCR testing four days a week. This is what's referred to as UD surveillance testing. There are two sites on campus. There's the Harker Ice Lab and there's Clayton Hall. Those both run Monday through Thursday. And then the state of Delaware uh, contracts with a company called Curative um, to run their public health testing, some of their public health testing sites. We have a Curative testing site on campus on the Laird campus in parking lot number six on Fridays. There will be a number of other um, curative testing events uh, happening around move-in and around um, the first week of classes. Um, we're looking at having a, an event on Saturday, um, February 5th um, at STAR campus that's hosted through Curative. Um, so look for more information once that is um, finalized. For symptomatic tests, so Student Health Services has um, a, appointments for rapid testing or for PCR testing uh, you know, with an um, appointment here at Student Health, um, that's Monday through Friday. Um, if your student needs um, medical advice over the weekend, we do have an on-call service. Um, and most of the time that student is okay to kind of lay low um, until, um, you know, getting an appointment for a test on Monday. Um, there are a couple of urgent care resources um, for students who need urgent medical attention um, over the weekend. So Kelly, I was just typing it to someone, but I'm sure I think it's something that I'm really proud of about the university. Can you talk a little bit about how the university does our own testing? Again, these wouldn't be the curative sites, but when a student is being tested within University of Delaware facilities, 
how is how are those what kind of tests are they and and it, are we sending it off to a lab is it a university well, who's who's doing that sure so um I'll start with the easy one which is the um rapid testing that student health services has so rapid rapid testing here is nasal testing um, we get the results in about 15 minutes um, you have to keep in mind that rapid testing is not as accurate as pcr testing so what you're gaining in rapidity of getting the, the results, you're losing a little bit in, in accuracy. So for symptomatic individuals who um, might be within zero to two days of their symptom onset or who have a negative rapid test, um, we would also send a PCR test for, for that, um, that patient. Um, the PCR testing that we do through UD surveillance testing. So this is what some folks, and I've seen it uh, referred to a couple of times in the chat, you might hear your students describe it as the spit test. Um, so this is a saliva test. Um, it is a saliva specimen that is collected um, in a, a vial that your, your student will provide the vial, the, um, the saliva. And then it's actually run, um, the test is performed through the virology department here on campus. Um, this is an established um, PCR test. This is not like a UD design test. We're, we're using tech, PCR technology that has existed um, on the, in the virology department um, for other purposes, certainly. Um, so the result turnaround time actually is quite impressive. Um, most of the time you'll have, uh, students will have their results the same day, um, almost always within 24 hours, um, potentially under rare extenuating circumstances, 36 hours. Um, they receive their results via email. Um, the results transmit automatically into their UD Health portal so they don't have to upload anything else. Um, if they test positive on a uh, UD surveillance test or on a student health test, obviously, um, they'll receive communication directly from student health. Um, if they're an on-campus resident, they'll receive communication from Residence Life and Housing um, about um, you know, helping them figure out uh, what the best plan for them um, to isolate is depending on their living situation. And uh, we help them with resources, um, whether that's medical resources, uh, help them with on-campus isolation space, help them um, arrange a time to go home if they're going home for isolation, as well as talk to them about their isolation period and uh, ways to help with their symptoms. We also, you know, um, we also will um, have telehealth services with COVID positive students, um, particularly students who might be at higher risk. So students who have past medical histories or medical conditions that put them at higher risk. They might take medications that suppress their immune system, so they might be at higher risk. We work closely with Christiana Care Hospital System here, um, who has a referral program for antiviral programs. Um, so you may have, may have heard about uh, monoclonal antibodies or Paxlovid or some of the other um, antiviral treatments that are available um, for patients at high risk of severe disease from COVID. And we work very closely with that program um, and have referred many students um, who are eligible for that type of therapy. So for our next question, I'm not sure who's best to handle it. So any one of you can talk over each other or raise your hand, whoever wants to jump in. Um, but the University of Delaware is doing a seven day quarantine um, and the CDC updated to five recently, a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Um, so can we just provide some context and rationale, the thought process behind that decision from a university perspective? Sure, and it is a good question. So the CDC guidance for the five-day isolation and five-day quarantine period came out for the general public. Um, we worked with uh, ACHA, which is the American College Health Association, as well as the Division of Public Health, um, as well as some of our other campus partners and, and epidemiology experts um, to look at what does that mean for a um, communal living environment. Um, some subsequent communication has come out from um, ACHA and from the CDC um, stating that um, for communal living environments, um, it's up to each kind of local campus as well as local public health department to determine if a five-day isolation and quarantine period is appropriate um, for their setting. So one of the things that we looked at very closely was the data of of the rate of positive, um, I'm sorry, the rate of folks who would still be contagious after a five-day isolation period. So if you look at the data, which is actually cited by the CDC in their um, announcement about a five-day isolation quarantine period, there's over 30% of folks are still contagious on day five. And given the uh, nature of our, of our community, the close proximity in the dorms, um, you know, the gym space, the dining halls, we did not feel comfortable with 30% of, of positive folks, you know, um, 
still being contagious um, after that time and, and rejoining um, you know, their, their uh, classmates and, and colleagues. So when we looked at, could we shorten the 10 day isolation and quarantine period? When, when would it be considered safe? When would we be more comfortable um, with someone discontinuing isolation? One of the key things to remember about a marker of contagiousness is symptoms. So if your symptoms have not improved during your entire isolation period, um, the, the, that patient should continue to follow the standard 10-day isolation period. So when we looked at the percentage of, of folks um, who would still be contagious after eight days of isolation, so seven full days of isolation, then coming out on day eight, that dropped to about 11%. The, when you go down, extend it past uh, 10 days, it goes down to about 3%. We were comfortable with that risk mitigation strategy um, in order to um, emphasize masking, you know, when students come out of isolation, when employees come out of isolation, um, and employing some of the other risk mitigation strategies that we use to try to reduce spread while allowing folks to get back to um, their normal activities and get back to class. So just to review, so the recommendation is to isolate for seven full days after testing positive or after the onset of symptoms. And then on day eight, if your symptoms have basically improved or resolved and you hadn't had a fe haven't had a fever for 24 hours, then you can leave isolation on the morning of your eighth day. If on the eighth day you're still having symptoms or you're ha still having a fever, you should stay in isolation for 10 days and we'll be able to accommodate um, for that, um, for students in, in that scenario. For quarantine, so students, so individuals who are exposed to someone who tests positive for COVID-19, your recommendation for quarantine is dependent on your risk of contracting COVID. So if you're fully uh, immunized, meaning you're, you're up to date with vaccination, you're, meaning you either had a booster vaccine or you're still within the time frame of your primary vaccine. If you're exposed to someone who is positive for COVID, you do not have to quarantine. We do recommend that you monitor for symptoms for seven days and that you get tested day five or after, after your exposure. If you develop symptoms at any time, you should call student health and we can test you here. If you are unvaccinated or if you're not up to date with your vaccination, meaning it's been more than five months from your Pfizer or Moderna series or more than two months from your single J&J &J, and you haven't yet gotten your booster, you no longer have adequate protection to protect you against the COVID exposure. Those individuals, so unvaccinated individuals or individuals who are no longer up to date with vaccination for COVID exposure, they quarantine for seven days. They also should get tested with a PCR test on day five or after and monitor for symptoms. If they develop symptoms on any day, they should call student health and we can test them here. Awesome. Um, Kelly, that was so, I don't know, I, you're such a plethora, so much knowledge, it's so great. Okay. So, so it's a lot of information and, and it is, um, it, this, you know, this has changed very rapidly, um, you know, and, and we've been, when the initial you know, recommendation um, came out for um, healthcare workers initially, you know, the CDC has kind of given things in pieces and they've kind of said, you know, more to come for this population, more to come for this population, more to come for this population. So we do have to recognize that we have a unique uh, environment. So you know, institutes of higher education are unique environments in terms of um, communal living. So we have spent a, a great deal of, of effort trying to pull data from multiple different sources to figure out the, the best plan for our kids. Hey, Kelly, can I get you to ask or answer one quick question? A couple of folks have been saying, what if my student tested positive? How does the testing requirement apply to them? What, it, what, what, it, what guidance sure. would you give them? Thank you. And actually, thank you for reminding me. So just to follow up real quick on the previous um, conversation about isolation and quarantine, um, real quick. So someone who's had COVID within the past 90 days, if they have an exposure to someone who's, who's positive, they do not have to quarantine. That's a good question. Um, so yeah, so someone who's tested positive for COVID in the past 90 days, as long as they have submitted their positive test result to their UD Health portal, they're exempt from any testing requirement from 90 days from the date of their positive test. That would include pre-arrival testing. It would include weekly testing if they are an unvaccinated or unboosted individual. Um, as long as UD has record of their um, previous positive test. They should monitor for symptoms though, especially if they have an exposure. 
um, because although it's unlikely, it is possible to get reinfected with COVID um, within you know a three even shorter than a excuse me a three month time frame, um, especially with Omicron. Omicron's doing things that were a little bit unexpected, especially with the second strain of Omicron now, BA two. Um, so anytime anybody develops symptoms, um, you should have your your rate. Our, um, you know, keep that on your radar and give Student Health a call so we can um, evaluate you. We do have ways here at Student Health of, of using <clears throat> some additional features of the PCR data to determine if your infection is, is old or new. So if you test positive a second time, so to speak, um, we can run some additional tests to try to figure out, is this the same thing that you had two months ago or is this a new infection now? Kelly, I think I've got one more for you. I'll probably come back to you. But um, so why don't um, vaccinated students have to test weekly? Um, because they can, you know, we know that they can spread it, they can know that too. So can you provide the rationale to that, please? Sure. So this is one scenario where I think it's important to ding distinguish between vac vaccinated and boosted. Um, so there's basically three categories right now of risk, uh, you know, in, in an individual. Uh, there's a, an individual who's unvaccinated, so hasn't received any doses of COVID vaccine. There's an individual who is fully vaccinated. Um, I'm sorry, we should say four categories. So there's an unvaccinated individual, there's a fully vaccinated individual, and they're still within their primary um, efficacy of their primary series. So they're still within five months since their Pfizer or Moderna or two months since their single J&J. &J. Then there's folks who are no longer considered up to date with, in, with COVID immunization. So these are folks whose immunity from their primary series has worn off and have not yet gotten that booster dose to bring their immunity back up to a protective level. And then there's folks who are fully um, up to date with their COVID vaccination, including booster. So based on your degree of immune protection, so to speak, um, determines kind of your risk of testing positive for COVID or contracting COVID. So folks who are unvaccinated compared to folks who are vaccinated but not up to date with immunization compared to boosted. There's about a five-fold risk uh, reduction with someone who's boosted and about a three-fold risk reduction from someone who's just um, fully vaccinated compared to someone who's unvaccinated. So although you're hearing more you know, reports of folks who are getting breakthrough infections who, who have been vaccinated or boosted, it's still only about a 10% breakthrough rate. So 90% of people who have been boosted are not getting breakthrough COVID infections. So if we look at the risk of an individual testing positive for COVID at any point in time, the risk is by far the highest in an unvaccinated individual, followed pretty closely by someone who's no longer up to date with COVID vaccination. This is why those students, those employees, are at higher risk of testing positive and being contagious at any given point in time. The unique thing about COVID, as you all know, is that you can be contagious even if you don't have any symptoms. That's one of the reasons we're still in this whole mess, is that people are spreading this illness without even knowing that they're contagious. So this is where the asymptomatic testing comes into play. So unvaccinated individuals or individuals who are no longer up to date with vaccination um, are at a higher risk of being asymptomatically contagious and therefore spreading to their friends and their classmates and colleagues. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, so I saw a question at the very beginning and then I just saw another one. So this to me, I think is both Adam and Jose, but what is kind of the conversation on campus with you know, staff, um, you know, faculty probably a little bit, but mostly um, administration and staff about the plans for spring semester as it relates to outdoor seating, outdoor events, so that folks can socialize, be with their friends, and they don't have to have their mask on. And again, I know maybe the, uh, yeah, the, our current mask mandate. Um, so just what are the current conversations, what are the current thoughts um, you know, to look forward to? Yeah, I think increasingly um, we've moved and have had options for outdoor, um, community events. We certainly will once again um, have picnic tables in larger numbers than we've seen in, in past years for students to dine outside once the weather um, is amenable to that. And I think um, as we saw um, even last spring, more events we'll see outside for sure, Megan. Is there anything specific more that you wanted me to address with that or Adam, if you want to add? 
No, I, and I think that we, um, our, our student organizations and our staff that advise those also look for opportunities whenever they can to, to get folks outside and, and in the safest <clears throat> environments possible. So uh, I know that that's always something that's part of those programmer meetings when all of our campus programmers get together and have conversations about how to best, best facilitate programming. Um, they definitely, that is part of the conversation that they have and finding opportunities to get folks outside, get folks in safer spaces when possible. Yeah, I know there's a, a meeting of a bunch of people who plan events on campus just coming up in the next week or two. And I know in the spring, it was a lot of outdoor movies, outdoor activities, you know, on the different patios of Perkins Student Center and Trevant University Center. So I would very much anticipate both the dining options as well as socialized events will be. Um, our spring on campus is beautiful. Um, and so I, I know back in my heyday, I did outdoor concerts pretty regularly in the spring. Um, so hopefully something like that will be coming down the pipe. Okay. So um, I was trying to think through and of course I was distracted by Kelly's things. I didn't have my next question um, queued up. Megan, can I ask a question of Dr. Frick? Absolutely. Um, Kelly, there's a question about why we use the quote unquote spit test for PCR uh, versus the nasal swab. I, I, I don't know if you want to address that or if you can. Sure. <clears throat> I will do my best there. Um, it's because of the uh, testing equipment that we have on campus. Um, so the volume of a sample um, that is needed to run the test with the equipment that we have, with the existing equipment that we have in the virology department, um, requires the um, saliva as opposed to the, the nasal. Um, just so you know, um, there is a difference in accuracy um, of nasopharyngeal, so the old school, you know, back in 2020, where we used to do nasopharyngeal COVID tests, whereas where you had to go about four inches up inside the nose to the back of the nasopharynx, which is where the highest concentration of virus lives. Following that location, the highest concentration is in saliva, followed by the anterior nose, so the ones that go right inside your nostril, followed by a cheek swab. So you might see, you know, there's different products out there for, um, you know, home tests. Most of them are anterior nasal swabs. There's some, you know, I, I know there's stuff on the internet about should you also swab your throat and that kind of stuff. Um, I wouldn't recommend using any swab in any area that it's not indi uh, indicated for because um, the buffering solution is different based on the pH of what you're trying to, to test. So I like to get a little philosophical sometimes. Um, and a family member put in a really interesting question. So if each one of you want to share what makes you most concerned in terms of student life risks? Um, so again, obviously, this is a very philosophical kind of heady sort of question. It's a good way to end an hour presentation. Um, but I'm just Curious, you know, when you are in meetings um, and thinking through the work that we're doing at the, you know, the University of Delaware, what makes you most concerned and helps um, inform the work that you do in the practice that you have? Sure, I'll go. I, I can go first. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think first I'd want to convey that. Um, you know, our students' experience really, really matters to us. Um, and, and that's the full experience. And, and I mean that by their physical health, um, their, their mental and emotional health, uh, and their well-being in every dimension that, that you can imagine. And so um, we are working really hard to balance. We are very committed to in-person learning. Um, there's, there's no doubt about it and, and um, very committed to it because we know our students really need it. Um, and at the same time, we recognize that we're in a position uh, regionally and nationally where we know there's gonna be a large swath of our student body that would not have access to their classes during the first week. And that's what has driven us um, uh, to go online. The, the other piece is that we have a lot of dedicated employees um, and and for instance, during our first week in winter session, we had 12 to 15% of our workforce out because of Omicron. And so it's really important that for us to keep your students healthy and safe, we also need our employees to be here on campus. And so the pre-arrival testing uh, gets us a little bit closer uh, to 
to trying to weed out those students that might come and spread disease on campus. Um, and, and our employees do tend to be at a higher risk category than our students are just based on age and, and life experience. And then, and then I would just leave um, folks with the, the, this analogy really helps me. Um, you know, every, all of our decisions are mitigation strategies. Uh, none of them are fool foolproof. So what we talk about is Swiss cheese. Like if you look at one slice of Swiss cheese from the deli, there's holes in it. But if you look at the block of Swiss cheese, you can't look through it. And so each layer is another slice of Swiss cheese. It's a mitigation strategy. Each one has holes in it, but all together, it gives us um, a, a, a defense on campus that we have lived through the last couple of semesters and we have felt convinced that we're keeping our community safe. So we really appreciate your patience. Uh, we know it's hard um, uh, for you because you're stressed for your students. Um, and, and what I wanna remind folks is that week one, our campus will be bustling. Our residence halls, our dining halls, our student centers, our rec centers, our sororities and fraternities, our RSOs will all be meeting uh, and have the opportunity to meet. Um, and, and, and they certainly will have plenty of social outlets. So, thanks. Yeah, I think um, uh, this spring more than, uh, I, I just think we will have a really vibrant campus and I really appreciate Jose highlighting that. And even the conversations of some of our student leaders who have reached out saying, I can't wait to come back. Will you come to our first meeting? Will you come? So students are planning and getting excited about the return and being on campus and engaging. You know, I think the things that always worry me in relation to, to COVID-19 are the things that aren't even in the Swiss cheese block. We know that our students are not, um, 100% captive on our campus, you know, so we're, we're doing a lot to make sure students are thinking about the choices that they're making outside of their classroom communities or their RSO communities, having conversations about um, being a good community member um, and, and knowing that we can have great mitigation strategies on campus and we do and I really believe in the work that, that Dr. Frick, Jose, myself and others are doing to, to make campus as safe as possible, but I always worry about what happens when they leave campus. And I think that's why we are doing our best to make sure campus is as safe as possible um, and, and reducing the risks that, that, that happen within um, the opportunities we provide. Thanks, Adam. Um, certainly from, from my lens, the um, thing that most concerns me is an adverse outcome um, to an unvaccinated student or employee um, from, from COVID. Um, you know, we get a lot of questions about, well, you know, nobody dies from COVID or nobody on college campuses die from COVID. Nobody has any long-term health problems from COVID. Um, it, it's not true. Um, unfortunately, we have not had um, any um, uh, deaths from COVID on our campus. That is true. Um, but we have had students in the hospital with COVID. We've had students um, have to take medical leaves of absence um, because of COVID infection. We've had students um, have complications from COVID infections um, and now are on long-term medications who have, um, you know, are what I'm un unable to complete uh, their semesters at school. Um, a lot of you have probably heard about long COVID, um, which are long haul symptoms. Um, there's a significant population um, who experiences kind of long-term fatigue, brain fog. Those are pretty common with Omicron, unfortunately. And we're still learning a lot more about why certain patients um, get um, long COVID. There is a lot of good data that shows that vaccination is protective uh, or at reducing your risk of getting long COVID uh, if you do end up testing positive for, for COVID. Um, one of the difficult things with long COVID is that it doesn't seem to be indic uh, it doesn't seem to be related to the severity of your initial infection. Most patients with long COVID, so long COVID is defined as um, symptoms that last greater than 12 weeks and, and typically debilitating symptoms that last greater than 12 weeks. Most of the time, long COVID is in folks who are either asymptomatic or have um, very mild primary infections. Um, so there's still a lot that we need to learn um, about post-COVID uh, complications. Um, you know, folks ask all the time about, you know, the, the safety of, of vaccines. Yes, I mean, every vaccine, every medication, every Tylenol that you take has potential side effects. You know, I'm not gonna stand here and say that the vaccines don't have potential side effects, they do. But all of the side effects of a vaccine are much, much, much less common and much, much, much less severe 
than the complications that can happen with COVID. The days are gone when we thought you had a choice of either getting a vaccine or not getting COVID. That's not the choice anymore. If you're unvaccinated, you will, Omicron will find you, unfortunately. Um, it's just that contagious and it's just that common in the community. Um, so really, you know, stressing that this is a preventable, overwhelmingly a preventable um, disease and complications and, and mortality um, from this disease are overwhelmingly preventable with vaccination and boosters. So my personal biggest fear is um, a severe, a severe um, outcome uh, or, or, or you know, a, a death um, of a student or a faculty member or a staff member from COVID-19. Awesome. Well, thank you all. I was typing in the chat to a bunch of our family members who were sharing their gratefulness. I'm grateful that you all were here as well. Um, so thank you for engaging with us. Definitely thank you to my colleagues behind the scenes as well as University Media Services for helping us put on the Zoom webinar. And of course, to my lovely panelists um, who stick through all of this. Um, so just thank you so much for everything. And I hope everyone has a really great next week or so. And we're excited to have your students back on campus um, really soon here. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>